Good morning. Shalom. Peace be with each of you this morning and welcome to this time of worship. We are grateful that you have joined us and it is our prayer that these moments of worship will nourish your soul and draw you closer to God and one another. Online worshipers may wish to gather some food and drink to join us in communion later on. In a person, prayers of celebration or concern can be noted on the paper slips on the back of chair racks and brought up to our videographer who will get them to me shortly. Uh, for those of you at home, please do not Facebook chat or text in prayer concerns this morning. If you want to call the phone and leave a voice message, that would be fine. A few announcements uh, for all of us this morning. The elders will be meeting downstairs in Burrell at 1040 as our evacuee family who is living down there has been able to safely return to their home. So that's good news for them. Sunday school is being held in the first classroom upstairs as you enter the front door so as to not disturb our remaining two evacuees. Uh, speaking of Sunday school, we are in need of teachers. So if you are willing to be a teacher every four to six weeks, please let me know as we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, there is leftover cat food and kitty litter brought by the Humane Society for anyone who would like to take it home with them today on the front porch. We no longer need it anymore for our evacuees. If not, I would love for someone to volunteer to get it back to the Humane Society so someone else can use that elsewhere. Stay oh, thank you, Marky. Thank you. <laughs> Stan and Pauline are filling in for the choir today for special music in the absence of our beloved choir director, Jim, who was under the weather this week. He is feeling better, but earlier was running a temperature of 103. Uh, it is not COVID, not COVID, just letting you know, uh, just some kind of flu bug. Uh, and so we want to uh, keep him in our thoughts and prayers. And thank you to Stan and Pauline for stepping in at the last minute. The finance be, uh, team is meeting this Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, also, please sign up today for the yard sale, which will be October 2nd, if we have enough participants. If you think you can participate, finance team needs to know whether or not you are interested by signing up on the back sheet on the uh, table. Also, the pastoral relations meeting is Thursday evening. If you have ideas for strengthening my ministry with you, Please let Deanna, Steve, Wendy, Gail, A, or Elsa know. Again, that is for a meeting this Thursday. The folks are Deanna, Steve, Wendy, Gail, A, or Elsa. <clears throat> I'm finally grateful to announce that we have hired a new office manager. We are still working through the grief of Rhonda transitioning into her new business of her own, but she will be our videographer and she's here as a member. Uh, Julie comes to us with many years of gift and experience in administration within the military and in hospitals, as well as she already knows much of our office procedures. So she will fit in quite well. She's already started training. She will be training through this week. So please, uh, uh, she's back there at the back table with grand, grandson right now. Yay, Julie, we're so glad to have you. <laughs> It will be a wonderful transition for us. Mm -hmm. Are there other announcements for our church family? If not, then I invite you. Oh, sorry, Margie. Oh, sorry. Somebody called me and wanted to know if we still need, whether for our evacuees or evacuees in general, are we still collecting clothes? We do not need it for the evacuees at this time. Uh, they have, uh, most of our evacuees will be moving on. Right, yes, yes. But uh, I think there is an, uh, there are certain things the thrift store always needs. And if you have questions about that, ask Julie W. what they are always looking for. So if there are no other announcements, I invite you to take a deep breath and allow God to meet you in this time and place.
morning. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. God is here in this place calling all God's children to worship with their whole lives. God calls us to love and serve all people, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Come, trusting that God will always respond to our need. Come in trust, joy, faith, and deeds. In our worship and beyond, may we be a blessing to others as we serve God through our hands and hearts. Our opening hymn is in the red hymnal, number 600, Jesu, Jesu. Might just be canon 
and Olivia. <laughs> You'd like to come up? Yay! I missed Cannon. Yeah, it's so good to see you. And there's Miss Olivia. Yay! Come and, come and have a seat. I'm going to sit down too. Yes. Can you scoot a little over this way so I can see you? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Good morning. Can, I want to ask you what your favorite food is. Do you have a favorite food? What? A quesadilla. A quesadilla. Oh, that's yummy. Oh, I'm going to get hungry. Do you have a favorite food? Do you like um, broccoli? You do like broccoli. Oh, good. Yay. Good for mom for getting you to like broccoli. No, she's back there shaking her head. No. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite animal? What's your favorite animal? You're wearing it. What are you wearing? But that's not your favorite animal. Yeah. Okay, what's your favorite animal? A dog and a cat. A dog and a cat. Do you have, do you like dogs? Miss Olivia, you do, because you have a dog. Yeah. Do you have a favorite dog? <laughs> the one you have at home? Yeah. Oh, good. <gasps> you have puppies at home? Oh, puppies are the best. And I think. Oh, and kittens, too. And one froze. How did your grandma end up and your mom then end up with all those animals? <laughs> yeah, my grandma's like, I don't know. It's fun to have puppies and kittens and animals. I wonder, do you have a favorite person? A favorite person? Oh, you don't need to tell me. I don't want to know, but some people have favorite people in their lives. There's a story in the Bible about somebody who had a favorite person. And in the Bible, it talks about favoritism. When you show favoritism to somebody, you lift up your face. Can you lift up your face? Lift it up high. And you lift up your eyes. Can you make your eyes go up? And I'm going to drop this. And your smile, your lips go up. <laughs> Yay! Big smile. Yay, big smile. That's what it means to show favoritism to others. You lift up your face. Well, some people in the Bible did that only to the rich people, the people who wore gold rings and wore fancy clothes. And Jesus said, that's not a good thing. You should do that for the people who don't have gold rings all over their hands and don't wear fancy clothes. You should show favoritism by smiling and looking up even to the people who are poor and don't have a lot of money. You can do that too. Yes. So I want you to remember to show favoritism to everybody. Smile, look up. Let's get a big smile to the ceiling. Ah, big smile. Big smile. Look up. Yeah, to everybody and show them love, okay? I think we could thank God. Can we thank God today for, what can we thank God for today? For animals? I like that, yes. Is there something else we could thank God for? Hmm. Can we thank God for mommies and daddies? Can we do that? And grandmas and grandpas? Okay, can you fold your hands and close your eyes and repeat after me? And big people can do it too. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For animals. For animals. For, animals. for mommies and daddies. For mommies and daddies. And grandmas and grandpas. Grandmas and grandpas. Amen. Amen. Amen, Olivia said. Thank you so much. I got so excited 
showing favoritism to the children that I forgot to give them their gift. So thank you, Lexi, for filling in for me. <laughs> the kids lead us in prayer by starting us off, reminding us there are many things to be thankful for. And we do do that in our prayer time. We are thankful for each of you who are present to this day, and we are thankful for the people online. And it is in the community as we join all together to pray that we are united in asking for God's intervention on the following people. Please be praying for Kate P. She had open heart surgery to replace an affected heart valve. And fortunately, it seems that she suffered a major stroke during the surgery. She is in Mercy ICU on a ventilator. They will know more of the extent of the damage over the next few days. It is heartbreaking, and we ask that you will keep her husband, Greg, the friends and her family in your prayers as we wait to see uh, in these uh, heartbreaking times. Our sympathy extended this week to Zonia and friends of family of Michelle, her good, good friend who tragically died this past week, way too young at 55. And uh, Zonia was a servant and a witness of God who helped lead in that impromptu celebration of life. And I give thanks to God for the way God is working in Zonia's life to do this and comforting her friends and family. We pray for Bud's friend, John Kay, fellow retired CHP with colon cancer who spread to the lymph nodes, and another friend of Bud's, Lance Hyatt's son, Derek, with serious brain cancer in his mid-30s. Please be praying for them. Marie B. is having hand surgery on Tuesday. As the COVID cases increase, we encourage you, and I am wearing my mask even though I am vaccinated, to feel free to wear your mask. Uh, especially if you are unvaccinated, we ask that you wear your mask here, and we hope everyone will boost their immunity up to protect themselves. I personally bump up my vitamin D and zinc as fall and winter begin to uh, descend on us. We pray that everyone will be safe. Uh, for all the healthcare workers, we pray for them on the front lines and for the sick and their families as the ICUs are filling up uh, quickly with COVID cases in our community. We pray for all the folks who are affected in the Gulf and the East Coast by Hurricane Ida and the tragic loss of life and property during this week. We celebrate uh, this day that a grant which the church applied for has been approved for the pastor sabbatical in 2022, but I can't announce much more than that because there will be a media announcement to the city of Reading uh, prepared by the Lilly Foundation. Uh, but it is a very good thing and we celebrate because only a hundred churches are chosen nationwide each year for this honor and you are one of them. So congratulations church. I uh, also want to ask your prayers for uh, Gloria and Ellis. Uh, Gloria is having difficulty breathing, and Ellis is home with her today for uh, someone who's going to come in and help her in her breathing this morning. Are there other concerns or celebrations for our church family? Yes, Celeste. Um, for my friend Janae's brother Milo, who lost his battle with COVID, or COVID. Oh, no. <laughs> Celeste's friend Janae, her brother, lost his battle with COVID. Prayers for them. Yes, Linda. Continued prayers for Paul and B, please, and her husband. Continued prayers for neighbors of Linda and Rob, Colleen B, and her husband. Uh, yes, Linda. Also continued prayers for our neighbors, Josh, that passed away from COVID at 41 with seven children. They're, they're really processing it. Just Linda H's neighbor, Josh, passed away at 41 of COVID. Prayers for the whole family as they heartbreakingly go through this time. Yes, Susan. Um, continued prayers for the family, for the Queen family and the Yarbrough's who both had their um, celebrations of life yesterday and may they continue to be 
So the Blue family and the Yarborough family, prayers for comfort. If there are no others, I invite you to calm your hearts and focus in your minds on this time as God seeks to be in communication with us and to hear what is weighing deep within our souls. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Oh, dearest God, you have given us eyes to see, yet we see so very little. You have given us ears to hear, but we listen so very little. You have given us hearts to love, but we love so little. You have provided so many gifts in this world, geese that soar on the wings up high, lizards that scamper upon the ground, pets that become our very best friends, flowers that bloom in brilliant colors of the rainbow, trees that provide cooling shade, and friends and family that embrace us in joy and love. There is so much to be grateful for, O oh God. Forgive us for forgetting your blessings and focusing only on the negative. Turn us in the direction of healing and wholeness towards renewed vision and accurate perceptions. Show us how to use our works to reflect our faith. May we be empowered to use what you have given us to actively ease the burdens of the poor. For those on the margins of society, and for those who are oppressed because of the color of their skin, their gender, their age, their sexual orientation, or their position in life. Work within us that we will not play favorites with your people, but instead lift up the lowly who have been so broken by this world. Release us of our preoccupations with ourselves and what belongs to us, that we can rejoice in the knowledge that everything belongs to you, including us. We pray that you will heal those who are sick and hospitalized, that you will shower comfort and strength on those who are grieving that you will provide companionship for the lonely and courage for those who are afraid. Be the one to whom all can lean upon in the good and the difficult times. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs>
Today's scripture is James chapter 2, verse 1 through 7 and 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person, you say, stand over there, or here, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs to the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism? My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> When I was attending graduate school at Texas Christian University studying for ministry in Fort Worth, I worked at a home for unwed pregnant teenagers considering adoption. Young women would come from all over the country to stay during their pregnancy with the understanding that if they placed their child for adoption, all bills would be covered. Food, lodging, schooling, medical care, social life, fun, and even Sunday morning worship and spiritual care, hence my presence, were all included. It was, for me, an eye-opening experience, sometimes very rewarding and other times very troubling. I will never forget two young women during my time. One was a head cheerleader at a high school, 16 years old, beautiful and very popular. Her parents and her pulled up in a limousine, dressed like they had just stopped at Neiman Marcus before coming. Her suitcase was filled with all fancy maternity clothes. She donned the latest hairstyle and charmed everybody with her bubbly personality. From North Carolina, her parents had researched all the maternity homes in the nation and proudly stated that they wanted their daughter to be at the best facility there was. The one that had ended up on the cover of Life magazine and been featured in a 2020 special. I, count, I cannot count the number of times I heard the stories of how a famous reporter had come spent the week on campus highlighting what a wonderful place it was, almost like a secret resort for young women. The media had glorified the existence of this home and downplayed the trauma that so many girls went through in carrying a child to full term and feeling that child grow inside of them and then surrendering that child often being counseled not to even see the child after it was born or hold the child, but instead just to let it, that child, become a distant memory. In the same week that Miss Neiman Marcus arrived, another 16-year-old showed up, carrying a trash bag of everything she owned in her life. She took a city bus to get to us with no family support, and she was not exactly sure who the child of her father was. Whereas the first young lady spoke of a colorful world in her future that included college plans and beauty pageants, 
The other spoke of a gray world without hope. The first easily got her boyfriend to relinquish parental rights, while the second didn't even know how to reach the young man, young men that she had been with. The first was welcomed with open arms, the second with much hesitation and suspicion, partly because she was black. And there were laws in the state of Texas about the placement of black babies in white homes, which was the majority of potential adoptive parents for this upscale, very expensive program. Texas law required no discrimination with regard to admission, but social workers still spoke in very low whispers that they did not know how they would recoup the expenses of accepting this young woman. She saw their stares, their disapproval, and that sparked the beginning of my journey into unpacking the prophetic words of James to that community. You see, James became one of my favorite books in the Bible to teach to the staff, the administration, and those young women. The author of James was writing to a community who was in crisis, a crisis of bigotry and preferential treatment. Rich brothers and sisters in Christ were treating poor brothers and sisters in Christ badly. The rich were shown preference while the poor went without food, clothing, and shelter. We aren't really sure why the church James is speaking to is making such distinctions. It was, after all, against their law, as it clearly states in Leviticus 19. You shall show no preferential treatment. You shall make no distinctions between the rich and the poor. Distinguishing the worth of someone based on their wealth or any other characteristic was not just against the law. It was against the very nature of community and what it meant to be the church. But I could tell that for some, it was heady business. My supervisor, a master level social worker, would love telling me stories of the famous people she had met in her lifetime. Associations with people on Capitol Hill that were only names for me in the local newspaper. You know, that kind of association can really get to you if you aren't careful. It can give you an identity or a fake sense of self-worth by just attaching yourself to somebody who is well known. And you begin to think that by that process, by that association, you have become somebody. People will say, ah, you see that picture over there on the piano? I was at Graceland and I had my picture taken with Elvis. Or, hey, do you see that autograph of Peyton Manning on the game ball? That's worth a lot, you know. People stand in line for hours to own something like that. Why? Because it gives an individual a sense of worth, doesn't it? Fred Craddock states that what is most amazing about our text today comes in the questions that the writer poses to the community. James writes, why are you catering and giving preferential treatment to those people who are the very ones that abuse you and suppress you and deny you and mistreat you? They double your rent. They cut your wages. They won't give you a fair price for your produce. They oppress you and abuse you in every way. And here you are kowtowing and bowing at their very feet. You say, oh, please have my seat. It's really great to have you. And then you go around saying, did you notice who's here this morning? Maybe you or I can answer why that is. Why is it that the abused still cater to the abuser? Why does the woman who spent those years with a violent alcoholic husband, once divorced, marry another alcoholic? Why does the battered, the battered spouse finally get free only to return to the batterer? The writer says, I don't understand it. The very ones you put 
the very, the very ones that put you down. You elevate them. Somerset Maugham once said, the most deeply ingrained, the most deeply rooted instinct in civilized humanity is the desire for the approval of other people. I guess it's quite natural. And it starts out without any disease condition attached to it at all. We all have it. The problem arises, however, when that desire for approval begins to work on our psyche. When we start getting compliments like, Oh, good sermon, Reverend. That was the best one you've ever preached. I've never heard a better sermon in my life. Then what do you do? If that was the best, what do you do next Sunday? It gets addicting. We all need that approval. I have to have it. Then begins that decline. What do I do to get it? I must give people what they want. Find out what they want and then say that. Find out what they like. Give them that. Even if it's just bread and circus. Meet their expectations. That'll do it. Or one thing that always works is publicly confessing your faults and weaknesses. They'll think you're really honest. You are there yourself as, you know, just one of the people with you. And they'll say, oh, even though she has gold rings all over her fingers, even though that suit is from Saks Fifth Avenue, we saw him in blue jeans the other day working in the yard. I feel better about her now. I'll support her. There once was a Southern sem Senator long dead, and I will not give you the name, who was master at this. When the time came for re-election, he would put on old clothes and he'd pull out his old Plymouth that was stored in the garage for use during those election seasons. He would drive it around the countryside, stopping at farmhouses along the way. He'd introduce himself and say, you know, I'm your senator, been working for you, and I would like your vote. And by the way, I'm sorry to ask this, but while I'm here, do you mind if I go to the restroom? And the host would say, oh, sure, just come on in here. I haven't really cleaned it up, but you're welcome to use our bathroom. Oh, no, he said, I'll just go out here and find a tree somewhere. Reporters followed him around one day and said he went to the bathroom 30 times in one morning. <laughs> and everywhere he did, he got their vote. You can manipulate. You can treat people differently depending on what you want from them. You can twist what is right and wrong to justify your actions. But ultimately, we aren't fooling anybody especially God. When I started teaching out of the book of James, at first the administration and my supervisor really liked that, liked the idea of teaching those young women the value of good deeds, of treating others with love, the dangers of gossip, of speaking truth, and so on. Then we got to the place where James uplifts the poor and chastises the rich where James condemns the wealthy abusers and challenges preferential treatment. Then it became business, and it was clear my time was up. All that talk about the care for the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, had no place in their bottom line. In Jim Wallace's first year of seminary, he and his friends did a thorough Bible study on every verse in the Bible that dealt with poor and social injustice. They came up with thousands. In the first three Gospels alone, one out of every 10 verse, and in Luke, it's one out of seven verses, which deal with the poor and social injustice. Yet the studies Yet the students could not recall a single sermon that they had ever heard in their home church about the poor. One of them then pulled out an old Bible and began to cut out every single Bible verse that dealt with the poor. Out went the Psalms. Out went most of the prophets. 
And that old Bible could barely hold together. You see, they had created a Bible full of holes. So James says, if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Amen. Okay, yeah. And that is the end of the gospel spoken this day. <laughs> Dear friends, we are uh, invited to gather at a table for rich and poor that welcomes everyone to this table, no matter who you are. And as we prepare to gather at this table, let us stand, if you are able, and sing number 687, In Christ There Is No East or West.
Thank you, God, for these gifts in their many forms. Guide us in living a life worth worthy of your love. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> The scripture this week gave me a sense of guilt. As an elder, I feel a sense of, responsibil of responsibility to volunteer much more than I do. And the scripture states that faith without action is dead. But I struggle to believe that to be true. If there were 25 hours a day in an eight day week, I'd probably sign up for more responsibilities. <laughs> but I need to have faith in knowing that what I'm currently doing is enough. It is enough that I prioritize providing a stable, consistent environment for my toddler growing up in such an unsettled world. It is enough that I pray for our congregants and their families, even if I don't approach you personally to verbalize my sentiments. And it's definitely enough that I donate a dozen mini banana bread loaves to the holiday boutique <laughs> just to buy half them back because making banana bread is one of the few culinary skills I have. <laughs> I am enough and so are you. Your faith is enough. Faith without action isn't dead, it's faith and that's enough. For on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread and broke it when he had given things, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup saying, this is, oh wait, this is the cup. One of these is the cup. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and as often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. <laughs>
<clears throat> Personally speaking, I am one of those who is very grateful for Erin's banana bread, my favorite food of all time, and her provisions to our boutique, which actually is a fundraiser that we might feed others in our community, that we might put our faith into action. For we do remember that there are many ways, many, many ways to put your faith into action. But that is the key. Faith by itself, it, if it has no action, is dead. So dear friends, go to live your faith the best you can every moment of the day by caring for the weak, by uplifting the lowly, by providing for the poor, and by doing so reflecting God's love to all the world. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now we will join together in our hymn of commitment. May you run and not be weary. Please stand if you're able.